this is Eric Harris. Every day, he waits for the school bus to drop off his youngest daughter. Eric is a stay-at-home dad in Iowa City. He's also a convicted felon. I have unlawful use of a firearm in 1997. I have possession with intent to deliver marijuana in 1999. And then I have a looting, 2014. For quite some time, Eric Harris has been trying to get his voting rights back. He wants to have a voice in the world around him. Right now, Iowa is the only state in the country that does not automatically restore voting rights to convicted felons when they are released from prison. But some people in the state want to change that. This is Daniel Zeno. He's a lawyer for the ACLU of Iowa. And this is Greg Baker. He works for the Family Leader, a conservative Christian group in Iowa. The two seemingly opposite groups are just part of the coalition looking to rewrite Iowa law. So in uh, January of 2019, the governor in her uh, condition of the state speech uh, publicly announced that she would support a constitutional amendment to restore voting rights of people in Iowa with felony convictions. Through the power of clemency, the governor can restore those rights. And I've done that 88 times since taking office. But I don't believe that voting rights should be forever stripped, and I don't believe restoration should be in the hands of a single person. Uh, that was a huge change, right? What, what that did was essentially change the position of the Republican Party in Iowa, which was a big change. Uh, a change that we welcomed, we supported. Um, the ACLU of Iowa and others had been, have been working on this issue um, for, for years, um, and this change was a positive change. So after that, that change was announced, that uh, the governor announced her support, a bill was introduced. And the bill is called House Joint Resolution 14, or HJR 14 for short. And what that does is changes the Iowa Constitution so that once a person has completed their sentence, their right to vote will be restored. It went through the House first. Um, it passed subcommittee three to zero, the House Judiciary Committee 21 to zero, and the full House 95 to two. The bill then went to the Senate and it passed the Senate subcommittee two to one and then stalled in the Senate Judiciary Committee. So the work we have to do in the 2020 session is get it out of the Senate Judiciary Committee and then out of a, a full vote on the Senate floor. If we're able to do that, and we're, we're cautiously optimistic that we can, that will be step one of changing the Iowa Constitution. So the amendment has a long way to go. In the meantime, groups like the ACLU and the Family Leader are outlining their reasons for supporting the measure, and there are many. And when you study Christianity, it really shapes the way you're gonna view people that made mistakes. Um, not just felons, I mean people making mistakes, period. Um, Christianity is a faith that we all mess up, that not a single person achieves perfection, and that we all break God's law. And in God's eyes, with his law, every single one of us is a felon, everybody. So when you look through that lens, um, there's not that much that separates us and mankind. And I look at their lives and what we're talking about in this issue is not people who are currently in prison, not people who haven't paid their debt. These are individuals that serve their time, that we as a government, and the government is a collection of us people. So we as a people decided it was satisfied and we released them. And now we're still wanting to punish them after the debt was paid, and that's not God's heart towards us. It's full citizenship, and, and that's our heart. That's why we're in it. When you apply for a job, and you got to check the box, were you convicted of a felony, right? So difficulty getting a job. There are some uh, landlords who won't rent to people who've convicted of, who've been convicted of a felony. So trying to find housing. Um, if you don't have a job, getting a car, transportation, right? Um, there's also sort of those intangibles of when parents or guardians or adults bring kids to go vote. That doesn't happen if you, if you yourself can't vote. 
and and you know from from the people we've talked to uh, who've been convicted of a felony just the sense of I want to vote for the mayor of my town I want to vote for the person who's on the school board in my town Uh, because I care about what happens to my kids or kids in my community kids in my family Um, and so that sense of, of othering that sense of yeah, you're here, but you can't do the thing that the rest of us can do. Like getting a job, I've had some pretty bad experiences with that. I've had I've had times where I was like overqualified for a job, but once they do a background check, there's no job. Um, I also had people treat me in a way that I think was kind of biased, you know, like, oh, he has a felony, you know, so they try to treat me differently. I feel betrayed because I, I held up my end of the bargain. I did my time. What about you? Let me return to this country and be a citizen, you know, give people a chance. There are plenty of people who just want to participate, who say, yes, I made a mistake. I admit, I made a mistake. I did something wrong. There are consequences. And I suffered those consequences. And I'm continuing to by having to pay off restitution or court costs or court fees. But at some point, it should end. It's really frustrating. Especially um, knowing that I can drive approximately about one hour to the other side of the Mississippi. If these cases would have happened on the other side of the Mississippi, I would be voting. So a river makes a difference in me being able to vote or not to vote. I chose to make this place my home. And, and I think it's the best place you know, that I want to raise my children in. It's kind of peaceful here. It's not a lot of trouble here. So it makes it where, like, I have no, you know, I kind of don't have no choice because my kids come first. So I want to make sure that they're safe. I can't just say, oh, you know, I want to get up and go back to Illinois because I'll be able to vote. I can't do that. I just have to, like, wait it out and maybe somebody will make some changes and change this law because, you know, it's basically just, We're just looking silly as a state. As of December 12th, Iowa became the only state in the nation to not automatically restore a felon's right to vote. Now the pressure is mounting to get Iowa out of last place. I think we can do this. And I think the House has shown that we can do it together. Um, Just the fact that that chamber came to that much of an agreement, I think shows there's many ways and different paths to come to a yes vote. And I think the Senate needs to just have a discussion, which they started. I mean, we weren't that far last time. Um, Discussions take time. The House started the process. Now the Senate gets to start the beginning of their session with that discussion. And I think once we get there, um, this unique of a coalition, I think a lot of people will find a way to yes. There, There was polling from February of this year Des Moines Register poll that showed over two-thirds of Iowans support ending lifetime disenfranchisement. That's majority support across the political spectrum, whether you are uh, uh, identify as a Democrat or identify as a Republican or identify as independent. So there's broad support for this um, because it's just so extreme, right? Um, again, a, a, a person who Damage was a rag bri bike. And if the damage is worth more than $1,500, that's a felony, right? And, and often that's not what people think of when they think the word felony. But in Iowa, that's what a felony could mean, right? You could be convicted of a felony for stealing property that's worth $1,500 or more. A college student who steals an Apple laptop, that could be definitely worth more than $1,500. That could be a felony conviction, right? And so what we're doing in Iowa is trying to change that so that a person who's convicted of a felony, once they, they've completed their sentence, uh, they get the right, the right to vote. Um, what that means is they get the right to be eligible just like the rest of us, register just like the rest of us, be subject to all of the election laws, the voter ID law, all of the laws, right? So they don't get anything special. All they get the right to do is be treated just like the rest of us. And we think that's that's a good way to go. It should be a right that sticks. Just like we have, you know, 
amendments that say people, I mean, that say people can have firearms or they can do this or they have the freedom of speech. That should be, I don't need a firearm, I just want to vote. When you're not voting, you feel like that you're not a part of this country. And some people may see it as, oh, well, just don't worry about it. You know, it'll be all right. But no, I worry about it. That's all I want. I just want to be able to vote.